People are rising up everywhere, from Chile to Hong Kong to Lebanon, Iraq, and France. But why are some of them good and others violent? What makes a protester courageous? What makes a protester bad? Which ones are rioters? And which ones are fighting the good fight? If you're watching mainstream media, sometimes things can get confusing. Protests are described as a violent mob in one country and a pro-democracy revolution in another. And some protests don't get any coverage at all. Who decides which protests are worthy of which labels? and why. To help you navigate this confusion, here's my handy guide to worthy versus unworthy protests. First and most importantly, it's all about location, location, location. To all you protesters, rioters, and violent mobs out there, if you want that coveted peaceful protester label that garners nonstop headlines and Western adoration, it's crucial that you protest from a country or territory that's on the U.S. State Department's hit list. Protest against the government in Venezuela, Iran, Nicaragua, or Hong Kong, and you're guaranteed to get the hero treatment in U.S. media, and probably even some lavish funding from USAID. It literally doesn't matter why you're protesting. It could be for better living conditions or for a violent right-wing ideology, which in these places it usually is. You're pretty much guaranteed to be portrayed in a positive light no matter what you do, no matter how much violence you inflict. That's that's why the right-wing mobs that overthrew Bolivia's democratically elected socialist president Evo Morales were simply referred to as protesters, no matter how violent and racist their behavior was. Lucky for those right-wingers in Bolivia, the U.S. doesn't like Latin American countries to have socialist leaders, especially where there are resources to mine. So for two weeks, these violent right-wing mobs rioted for the downfall of Morales after refusing to accept the results of his re-election. They broke into Bolivian radio offices forced out the workers and tied one of them to a tree and were still called protesters. Even after they kidnapped and publicly tortured a Bolivian town socialist mayor, forcibly cut her hair, doused her in red paint, and paraded her through the streets barefoot, the BBC referred to them as a crowd of protesters. The New York Times also saw these kidnappers as merely protesters. Meanwhile, the US-supported military coup against Morales following the riots was celebrated as a victory for anti-government protesters. Really makes you wonder how these people would have covered Pinochet's violent takeover of Chile in 1973. It would have gone something like pro-democracy protester Augusto Pinochet succeeded in unseating authoritarian leader Salvador Allende. It's a bright future for the Chilean people under this new democratic order. Right-wing mobs in Venezuela that have literally lynched people get the same royal treatment in Western media, in lockstep with the U.S. government's operation to overthrow Maduro. The same goes for protests in Hong Kong, where the U.S. is funding a violent anti-China separatist movement that regularly beats up those who disagree with them, often flagrantly on film. They recently lit a man on fire. And how does the media describe these people? Pro-democracy and anti-government activists. Peaceful <laughs> demonstration inside. It was a peaceful protest of pro-democracy activists. These so-called pro-democracy activists haven't said much about democracy. They're just anti-China. Hence, they're good, lovable protesters. Speaking of which, for those of you protesting governments that are friends with the US, you're shit out of luck. You're not protesters, you're violent mobs of rioters, or your protests are treated like they don't exist. In Chile, there were massive demonstrations in the streets against the austerity measures of Chilean President Sebastian Piñera, who sent in tanks to quell them. Security forces were blinding, torturing, and killing protesters. But Piñera is an ally of the US government and corporate interests. So unlike the demonstrators in Bolivia or Venezuela or Hong Kong, the protesters in Chile aren't protesting, they're rioting continued in spite of a curfew imposed for a second consecutive night. Looting and riots have spread across the country. The US government, for its part, blamed Russian meddling for stoking the protests in Chile, while praising the violent coup by their allies in Bolivia as a win for democracy. Kinda makes terms like protester and democracy meaningless, huh? Or how about the protests in Honduras against the US-supported government whose neoliberal regime has impoverished the country and encouraged the violent pillaging of its natural resources to the detriment of indigenous communities. But these aren't protesters, they're... An angry mob faces off with Honduran security forces. The same goes for protests against austerity in Ecuador, where US ally Lenin Moreno used violence to crush dissent and take more power. When these protests were covered, they were labeled as violent in the headlines. The protests in Iraq and Lebanon have really confused the White House. That's why they were quiet for so long, trying to figure them out. On the one hand, there are poor Shias. That's scary. On the other hand, there are DJs, liberal activists, and anti-Hezbollah protesters, 
getting Washington and the media excited. And Iraqi Shias have even targeted the Iranian consulate in their rage against the entire system. That gets Washington really excited. Where do weapons fit into all of this? In some places, you can still be a protester even if you're armed and fascist as long as you're agitating against the government in one of America's shitless countries. Like those peaceful pro-democracy rebels in Syria and Libya that turned into Al-Qaeda and ISIS. They got called protesters even after they shot at people. Then they graduated to freedom fighters and cute rebels. So cute, right? But Palestinians? Forget about it. You can't even carry a rock or you're a terrorist. And definitely don't approach any fences or you'll get shot and the international media will lose interest even as the body count rises into the hundreds. You see, protests are worthy or unworthy based solely on how they impact US geostrategic interests. So protest accordingly. Good luck.